So good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Maranga, and today I'll be talking about my current research on the functional notation of metagenomes. Uh, so probably for this audience, I'll not have to emphasize much on why the gut microbiome is important, but um, one of the challenge we face with gut microbiome analysis is the annotation. Um, so most of the microbial uh, pro, uh, functions encoded in the human gut microbiome remain poorly understood. And uh, this is because um, we can only annotate uh, roughly 50%. Uh, uh, so um, this um, it's a major challenge, especially in understanding how the microbiome is associated with diseases or how um, performs other functions like metabolism and so on. And for, so for example, uh, this figure is taken from the metagenomic study, uh, depending on how we define function. And um, some people are interested in denotology, uh, other pathways like KEG, metapsych. And looking at this figure, we see that uh, with denotology, and um, which is um, has a high coverage somehow, but then uh, we can only annotate roughly 50% uh, of the metagenome assembled genes. And um, this is because most of the methods that are used for uh, human gut microbiome function analysis, they're based on homology. And uh, that's why we need more automated methods to characterize gene functions. And uh, how I said to go about it is to turn into uh, molecular biology for inspiration. For example, essentially use a protein sequence uh, determines protein structure and protein structure is responsible for protein function uh, paradigm. Uh, so for metagenome annotation, I'm using this method known as deep functional residue identification, uh, in short form DeepFry. Uh, so DeepFry was um, developed by our collaborators from the Flatiron Institute, and uh, this method takes input protein sequence and structure. Uh, so the protein structure is represented as a network of interactions known as contact maps. And uh, it takes input this uh, structure and um, sequence and tries to create embeddings and uh, the, the, the model is trained to identify short range in, um, interactions within the protein uh, residue and long range interactions defined by protein structure to try and learn structure function relationships. So for each protein, uh, the method tries to output the genotology probabilities. And uh, I'm also comparing this method to a uh, widely used uh, method known as eggnog. So eggnog is based on evolution. So uh, it's based on the principle that uh, within an uh, autologous group, a function is conserved. So I'm trying to compare these two methods and see uh, how much uh, conclusion we can derive from them. And uh, I'm going to briefly uh, take you through the, my, my pipeline. So this pipeline integrates de novo genome reconstruction, taxonomic profiling, and functional annotation. Uh, so first, it takes input um, reads, Illumina short reads, and then uh, performs um, assembly using megahit and tries to bin uh, this context into metagenome, assembled genomes using metabat and does taxonomic assignment using GTDB. Uh, for the second phase, that is the functional notation phase, I tries to predict genes using Prodigo and then clusters these genes uh, based on sequence identity at 95% using CDHIT uh, to generate the non redundant gene catalog. And the, for the functional notation, uh, we are using these two complementary methods. That is a deep fry, uh, which is based on deep learning, and then um, eggnog that is based on ontology. Not so. Um, so uh, we've clustered these genes based on sequence identity uh, to generate our non-redundant gene catalog. So uh, we designed a custom Python script that tries to map um, uh, from a mapping between the uh, functional annotated gene catalog uh, and mags. Uh, so uh, since the gene catalog is 95% non-redundant, so we try to propagate genes within each cluster and annotate genes within MAGS. And um, for this step, we're able to do further downstream analysis, such as pangenome analysis, and um, also um, analyzing uh, function encoded within each individual species. Uh, so to understand how function works, uh, so I tried to analyze uh, data uh, from the DAB immune microbiome cohort. Uh, this is the infant gut microbiome data collected from um, Northern and Eastern uh, Europe, uh, Finland, Estonia, and Russia. So I aggregated around uh, 1,000 metagenome samples. 
And uh, so these are some of the results I have for this analysis. Uh, so from the Derby mu data constructed around 7,000 um, mugs, of which uh, 2,000 were high um, uh, complete, uh, com high complete, high quality uh, mugs. These are mugs with have a, a completeness of uh, greater than 95%, 90% completeness and less than 5% contamination. And the Naridala gene catalog consisted of 1.9 million genes. Uh, so um, the first step of the functional analysis is validating. So we are having a method based on deep learning. The other one is based on um, eggnog. So we try to validate uh, this annotation. So our gene catalog consists of 1.9 million genes. And uh, so for this validation st uh, step, I only uh, selected, um, cons uh, considered only molecular function branch. So for gene ontology, it produces, uh, can be biological process, a cellular component or molecular function. So for this step, um, we use the molecular function and defy thresholds of 0.2. Uh, so first, uh, quantify uh, gene ontology based on the Shannon information content. And what we mean by Shannon information content is that uh, it tries to measure how specific a geotherm is. Uh, and it's expressed as negative log two probability of a geotherm. This is the probability of observing um, gene ontology term in Unipro database. Uh, so uh, we know that gene ontology terms is hierarchical. So meaning that it starts with uh, very general processes and then descends with uh, more specific uh, processes. And uh, if a protein is annotated as five prime mRNA, five prime UTR binding, it automatically receives um, all labels suited with it. And as we go up the tree, we find more general terms like binding, which doesn't really tell us what that protein is involved in. And uh, the more uh, geotherms are notating many genes, we have low information content. But then uh, we go down the tree uh, where we have more specific geotherms like uh, mRNA 5 prime UTR binding. Now we see this is a, a very specific term. So we have more high um, information content. So comparing those two methods, first um, looking at the concordance. So how well do these methods agree? Uh, so concordance is uh, defined as uh, for each gene uh, predicted by eggnog and defy, how well do those annotations agree? Uh, so looking at the concordance between uh, these two methods, so the, the orange bars are the discordant and the blue bars are the concordant. So uh, comparing uh, this across spectra, we see that the agreement between deep fry and eggnog is high. Uh, ranging between 50% to 90% in some sparse regions. So this means that um, these predictions uh, that are predicted by deep fry and eggnog, they agree well. So meaning that deep fry does not just randomly uh, predict geotherms. And now shifting to a different perspective, that is the genes annotated between uh, by both methods. Uh, so to recap, we had around 1.9 million genes um, in our gene catalog. Uh, so we can see that deep fry um, annotates almost all the genes in our gene catalog. So 99% of the genes obtained um, geotherms, uh, molecular function, uh, when eggnog only predicts around um, 12%. And uh, comparing the uh, intersection between uh, those gene sets uh, and, uh, annotated by both methods, we see that uh, there's around 219, uh, 219,000 um, that are common between eggnog and deep fry. Well, deep fry predicts uh, uh, more unique, uh, that is 1.6 million genes. So, uh, so we can see that deep fry somehow increases the annotation coverage and uh, we're able to predict more functions and um, having a better representation of the functions encoded in the human gut microbiome. And uh, as I mentioned in my earlier slide that the gene ontology is hierarchical. Uh, so we can have a term associated by having multiple associations to, um, uh, to a broader, a more general term, uh, while also having other associations to a more specific term. So, uh, so for any downstream analysis, uh, so I filter out uh, these general geotherms, this to compensate for the annotation differences between DeFry and eggnog. And uh, we use a subset of informative geotherms and which is obtained by traversing the geotree and only uh, selecting terms that satisfy certain criteria, uh, such as terms associated with more than uh, 2,000 unit protein families and their descendants um, contain less than 2,000 uh, unit protein families. 
Uh, so filtering out these geotherms, of course, it's going to reduce the number of genes annotated by both methods. And now looking into the proportion of the gene abundance with functional annotation, this is the metagenome level uh, coverage uh, between deep fry and eggnog. Uh, we see that deep fry uh, here in blue, um, well, it still uh, improved the annotation coverage with around 25% of the, uh, an average of 25% of the metagenome um, um, annotation coverage, uh, while eggnog just gives you like roughly 15%. Uh, but then uh, we see there are some samples that deep fry is able to annotate uh, more functions, so which I'm going to discuss uh, in my uh, other slides, why eggnog is able to annotate some samples well, while the others is struggling. And um, the other question I had is, uh, we've seen that in a metagenome level, deep fry is increasing coverage, but then how does it perform across taxonomy? Uh, is, are there are other species that deep fry is annotating well, or how about eggnog, which is based on orthology? And uh, looking at the phylogenetic uh, placement of, now these are high quality mugs that I talked about in my earlier slide, uh, around 2,000 uh, mugs. So, um, so the inner ring, uh, it's the bacterial class. So this mug spanned 10 uh, classes. And as we move here on top, uh, this is the annotation coverage coming from deep fry. And uh, this is the proportion of uh, genes annotated by, by deep fry and eggnog. And uh, as we zoom down to this region that has white, uh, which corresponds to Estrichia. So we see that eggnog is able to annotate well genes coming from uh, Estrichia genera. And uh, so eggnog is based on orthology. Uh, so uh, Estrichia is one of the most, like E. coli is one of the most well-studied organisms. So eggnog is able to uh, to extract more functions and we have we know more information coming from um, this uh, species. But then uh, as we move outwards, um, the phylogenetic tree, we see that eggnog is losing information. So coming to like bacteroides, which is very diverse. So we see that eggnog is not able to annotate well this uh, species. Uh, but then um, with deep fry, which is based on deep learning. So deep fry, uh, it tries to extract uh, structure function relationships. Uh, we don't see this kind of behavior. So deep fry somehow, um, it annotates um, species uh, uniformly. So sorry, so the annotation is somehow uniformly distributed across the phylogeny tree. So we're able to get a better representation of the, of the, of the functions. And uh, the other important aspect of the workflow is the pangenome analysis. Um, so this workflow supports uh, pangenome analysis in a reference-free manner. And as we see with MAGS, we're able to generate some information on there. It gives insight to genetic diversity and coding in the microbial communities. And um, a pangenome uh, can, be, can be defined as the entire gene set of all strains of a species. And uh, we have to, it can be categorized into two, co-genome, that is the genes shared by genomes within a species or accessory genome, that, that's the genes present in a subset of, of the genomes within a species. So this workflow is able to support per genome analysis in a reference-free manner uh, using MAGS. Uh, so therefore, the pan-genome construction um, only recruits uh, near-complete genomes. Uh, genomes with a complete minus of uh, greater than 90% and less than 5% contamination and only species that contain um, more than 10 genomes. Then uh, I define code genes as genes present in greater than 90% of the marks, and accessory genes as genes present in less than 90% uh, of, of the marks. And um, of course, I wanted to see how well deep fry and eggnog annotates uh, our pan genomes. So uh, this figure uh, shows the size of co and accessory genomes stratified by functional annotation from deep fry and eggnog. And um, so the, the, the blue bars are the core, part of the core genome that is annotated, and the orange ones, the core and annotated. Uh, green ones is accessory genome annotated, and the red bars are the accessory, accessory genome and annotated. Uh, so we see a similar pattern, like how we saw in the phylogenetic tree that eggnog is able to annotate uh, better the like E. coli, but then uh, it's struggling when it comes to other species. So uh, for deep fry, it's around 25% uh, of the code genome annotated and 15% of the accessory genome. And compared to eggnog, that annotated only 16% of the core and 5% of the, of the accessory genome. 
and uh, to sum uh, to sum up, uh, to pre uh, presented a workflow that is updating um, metagenome functions at high coverage, and uh, we've seen that DFRA is not sensitive to taxa, so it's able to have a better representation of the of the functions. And uh, so tomorrow, to, to on Wednesday and today, uh, my colleagues will be presenting on the uh, now structure assisted uh, predictions using G GCN and how they are being applied to uh, metagenome uh, data, as well as my mother colleague Pavel will be presenting on function cosi on the improvement of DFRI. And uh, so this workflow is available for use in our GitHub page. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and. Have a